Hi, hi everyone. I'm going to start with proper introductions in a moment. It's that sort of it's that time at the beginning of online meetings where everyone's arriving and there's the strange silence as you're kind of not quite sure sort of who's still in waiting rooms or when people are coming. So it's, it's even stranger with the, the, the Zoom webinars because I, I don't see anyone. I can just see the number of number of people who are, who are here is rising. So I'll, I'll give it a minute or two before I do a kind of uh, start the proper introductions. So please just bear with us as we're, as we're silent in the background as well. <clears throat> it's also very hard for me to stay silent for two minutes um it's uh, it feels an awfully long time when you're sat looking at the screen um i think you know we've got a, we've had a couple of people joining um still um but i think i will start with the introductions everyone so um firstly um a, a sort of a welcome. I'm Stuart Fishwick. I'm the head of school here for Geography, Geology and the Environment. And it's a real pleasure to be able to welcome you, um, well, at least in the online sense, to the School of Geography, Geology and Environment for the 61st annual Bennett Lecture. So this is the main public event of the year for geology and one that has a very long tradition that's named after Dr. Bennett. Dr. Bennett was a distinguished local practitioner and a man of some standing and influence in Leicester. He was the former president of the Leicester Literary and Philosophical Society, and that society itself was instrumental in the establishment of the University College of Leicester in 1921. Um, and I guess at this point, it's, it's clear to say that I do hope that people are aware of the ongoing events in the university to celebrate the centenary of this. Um, alongside the establishment of the University College, there was also establishment of the museum and the Polytechnic. Dr. Bennett was a keen amateur geologist, and in his memory, his daughters Rhoda and Hilda made a gift to endow a lectureship in geology, which is now commemorated in the F.W. Bennett professorship. Rhoda Bennett became librarian of the University College, retiring in 1961 and provided other gifts to the department, including a sum of money that's used since then to support this annual lecture. So since I joined the university, which was back in 2007, I've seen a diverse range of speakers and talks, whether that's on the evolution of the Alps, the fossil record from the Paleozoic, revolutions through geological time that shaped the planet, or an expedition into a volcano. And, and apologies for anyone who's here who's, who's given talks that I've missed in that. But for this year, we had a little further afield to hear about the NASA Psyche mission. So now as head of school, it is a real honor to be in the position to welcome our distinguished speaker, Professor Lindy elkins Tanton. And at this point, I'd like to hand over to Dr. Mark Reichow to give a further introduction. So thank you. Thank you, Stuart. Um, and it's it's my absolute pleasure to be able to introduce and welcome our speaker, Lindy uh, elkins Stanton. I know Lindy for many, many years through our work in large Ignis provinces, and I was fortunate enough to be employed through one of her many research grants, uh, for which I'm incre incredibly grateful. Uh, Lindy is the lead of the NASA Psyche Mission, Arizona State University Vice President and Co-Chair of the Interplanetary Initiative and co-founder of Eagle Learning, a tech company training and measuring collaborative problem solving and critical thinking. Her research concerns terrestrial planetary evolution and she promotes and practices inquiry and exploration learning. Lindy received her academic degrees from uh, MIT. She worked at Brown University MIT and the Carnegie Institution for Science before moving to Arizona State University. In 2018, she was elected to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and asteroid 8252 Elkin Stanton is named for her. I find it quite amazing, 8252, <laughs> amazing name. Well, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Professor Lindy Elkin Tanton. Thank you so much. What a pleasure to be here. And thank you so much for the invitation. Stand by um, while I share my screen so that I can show you pictures of the Psyche mission and where we are. Let's see. Okay, I think we're up. 
Yes, look good. I think we're set. All right, very honored to be here for the 61st Bennett Lecture to talk about the NASA Psyche mission. So if you think about space exploration, uh, we have visited bodies in our solar system that are rocky, like the moon. Here's a picture of the limb of the moon and the beautiful Orientale basin, this huge multi-ringed impact basin that you actually can't see from the Earth. So in a sense, this photo is a proof of our, of our orbiting around the moon early, early on before the Apollo astronauts even arrived. Here's another rocky body that, we've, uh, that we are currently visiting. This is a picture of Burns Cliff on Mars. It looks quite Earth-like, doesn't it? These rocks in their layers, these sedimentary layers of rocks. And we visited bodies that are made of ice. This is Europa, the moon of Jupiter, um, which we've uh, flown by and photographed. And shortly, we'll be sending a mission, a dedicated orbiter, to really find out what's going on with, with, with Europa. And we visited bodies made of gas and ice. This, of course, is Jupiter. But one thing that we have not yet visited is a body that's made mostly of metal. And that's what we think the asteroid 16 Psyche is. Um, it's called 16 Psyche because each asteroid has its number, which is the order of its discovery. So um, Psyche was the 16th asteroid ever found. And it was found by um, Annabelle de Gasparis at the observatory in Naples. Now, what do we know about 16 Psyche? Very little, because this is what it looks like from Earth. The thing that you just saw was an artist's interpretation. We have never flown by, we have no photographs of it. And from Earth, it just looks like a little star, which of course is what the word asteroid means, is star-like. Uh, these are the best images that we have of Psyche. It is um, potato-shaped. These are pictures of it as it rotates, um, 4.2 hours is its day. And um, this is from the European Southern Observatory. A number of groups have been spending time observing Psyche. It's much more rewarding to study an object that is about to be visited by a mission so that you can create scientific hypotheses that will actually be tested with real data. So it looks as if you can see at the bottom, perhaps there's what uh, some differences in brightness. We'd call that albedo, the amount of light that's reflected back, a dark area, a bright area, a sort of potato-shaped object. And I'll talk to you about what we know about Psyche, which is relatively little. And so I'm going to give you my standard caveat, which I always give when I talk about this mission, which is that um, uh, probably almost everything I tell you about the body today will prove to be wrong because space exploration does nothing if not uh, test our capacity for curiosity and imagination by showing us things we never thought of. And that's what we expect to see when we reach Psyche. This is about how big it is with some familiar places for scale. So as asteroids go, it's really quite large. Uh, it's about the size of the whole state of Massachusetts where I've spent most of my adult life. What do we think that it is? Well, let's go back to the very beginning of the solar system, which is the time of origin of what we now call asteroids. And, and I wanna spend just one moment even before I start talking about the very beginning of the solar system to say that the project that Mark and I worked on was a project about the Siberian flood basalts and whether or not they caused the end Permian extinction, the largest extinction in earth history. And, uh, and indeed we think in this long project, we really did sew together the story of how that happened. At its foundation, studying the Siberian flood basalts is studying a very large amount of liquid rock um, of magma. And that is what actually took me to start studying planets and eventually planetesimals, the tiny precursors of planets that were melted by short-lived radioisotopes. And so that's how my path as a terrestrial geologist and geophysicist took me out into planetary exploration and the many ways that it connects back to what we all do in, in geological departments today. All right, so here's, here's the sort of schematic about how our planets came to be. On the left, it's a sort of a timeline moving to the right. On the left, we have dust and gas and then eventually pebbles. So the dust and gas of our protoplanetary disk, the great big disk of dust and gas that coalesced in its center to become our sun and rotated around the sun and gradually formed up into planets. The first thing that this disk of dust and gas did was, uh, was form tiny pebbles once it was cool enough to form something the size of a pebble. These are called 
calcium aluminum inclusions because they're filled with calcium and aluminum and other elements that only condense at very high temperatures. So they were the very first to condense and they appear today in meteorites that fall to earth. And that in a sense is the whole story that I'm going to tell you today. The story of how we use meteorites to come to understand what's in our asteroid belt and how meteorites almost all come directly from our asteroid belt. And our asteroid belt is the remnants of that next step, planetesimals. And so some physical processes crush together these pebbles along with dust into bodies that we call planetesimals, little planets. These were the size of say a continent, the size of Australia, or the, even some smaller, the size of a very big city. Uh, and some of them you see with the red were melted from the inside by the very short lived radioisotope aluminum 26. This is a radiogenic element that only existed in the very early solar system. And it heated up these planetesimals, some of them to the point that they melted. Now, what happens when you melt an agglomeration of these little pebbles from the early solar system? Well, the bits that are metal melt and fall to the center and form a metal core. And the rest are the rock around the outside. That is the only way we know of that really concentrates a lot of metal in one place and it forms the basis of what we think that psyche is. So that's the very beginning of our story, our simplest hypothesis, what we call our fiducial hypothesis, that psyche is a part of the metal core of a planetesimal from that melting event that's called differentiation that creates the metal core and the rocky exterior instead of any longer having metal and rock intimately mixed in the form of pebbles. So those planetesimals collide together, they form planetary embryos that begin to, uh, the, the gradual process of clearing their orbits and accreting all together to form planets. So this is very early in the process. Now those very first pebbles have been dated from radiogenic isotopes to 4.568 billion years ago. So 4,568 million years is what we think of as the age of our solar system, those first pebbles. And the planets formed very fast. Recent evidence shows that Mars was probably completely formed in just 5 million years, but the final moon forming impact on the Earth might have been 100 million years into the process. So if the solar system's age was a 24 hour day instead of 4.568 billion years, if it was a 24 hour day, Mars was made in 94 seconds. And the planetesimals that I'm concerned with uh, were formed in, in just a few tens of seconds into our 24 hour day. So they're very, very ancient history. And now some of them are stranded in the asteroid belt. So that's in a nutshell, what we think that Psyche is. Again, we're likely to be surprised, but this is our idea. Now, a little bit of data. I think this is so interesting, this graph, because think about this as I walk you through it. It tells you about the progress of science and knowledge. On the horizontal axis, this is the year of publication of papers that discussed the density of Psyche. Now, why do we care about the density of Psyche? Because it is a measurement we can make from the Earth, and it tells us very fundamental things about what it could be made of. For it to be made of metal, it has to be very dense. Most asteroids are not very dense. And so on the vertical axis there is density. You can see that in the early years, say up to about 2010, 2011, 2011 is when we started writing our proposal, still looked like Psyche was pretty dense. And it's really only since then that the, um, the densities have settled down into a little range where people seem to be mainly agreeing that Psyche is more or less 4,000 kilograms per meter cubed. So what does that tell us if it's about 4,000? That yellow dot that you see there is the Psyche mission team's best guess based on all the best data of what Psyche's density is from our knowledge at the moment. So if you look at the red horizontal lines, there's one um, at the top uh, of, in the maybe middle end of graph, but the highest of the red lines that says camasite on it. That is the name of a metal mineral from the metal, uh, from a metal ast or metal meteorite. It's a, it's a mineral from a metal meteorite with its density above 7,000 kilograms per meter cubed. So if Psyche was a pure, iron metal meteorite, that's what it should be about 7,000 to 8,000 
uh, troilite, the next one down is, is iron and sulfur together, which is expected in that differentiation core forming process, still denser than psyche. And stitite, the next one down, is, is a rocky mineral, a silicate mineral, a little less dense than psyche. And then if you look on the right, other asteroids, there's Cleopatra that we're pretty sure is a metal asteroid. There are maybe only nine or 10 asteroids of all the perhaps one and a half million asteroids that seem to be made of metal. And Psyche is the biggest one. And it seems to be even possibly a bit denser than Cleopatra. And it's much denser than all the other asteroids, which are mostly in that gray patch down in the far right bottom. So you see that even though Psyche is not as dense as pure metal, it's perhaps the densest asteroid known. So we think it's a mixture of rock and metal. So there I've taken you through some of the reasoning here of what we think Psyche is, a mixture of rock and metal. Uh, there we go. Um, we look at the library of meteorites that have fallen to the earth for compositional analogs of what Psyche might be. You know, what has fallen to earth from the asteroid belt that might perhaps be Psyche? So what's our evidence? First, density that we've just talked about. Second, there are a number of quantities that can be measured by bouncing radar off Psyche, which, you know, frankly, I know this may seem a bit naive, but to me, it is still a technological miracle that we can have a radar dish on Earth, send a radar pulse all the way out to Psyche. Now, where is Psyche? Psyche is way past Mars, almost to Jupiter. It's in the outer main asteroid belt. So we can aim radar all the way, way past Mars, hit Psyche and get the reflected return, catch it back on Earth and learn about the characteristics of Psyche. So from radar, from reflected light, from looking at how Psyche warms and cools, um, we think that its surface is in fact fine grained metallic material. Then the third, so, there, so there's that so far, that's two lines of evidence, the density we can measure, and then these radar and thermal um, properties that we can measure. And thirdly, we can measure the way light reflects off this visible light and near visible light in, in both directions of shorter and longer wavelengths. We can look at the reflected light off the surface of Psyche and see what Psyche is absorbing from sunlight and what it is reflecting back to the earth. And that tells us something about its composition. So among all those variables, and especially the reflected light spectra that are very sensitive, there's one kind of meteorite on Earth that matches Psyche really well. And it is this incredibly obscure group of meteorites called the CB chondrites. So if you're a meteorite aficionado, I can tell you that phrase CB chondrite and you'll go, whoa, that's really crazy. Uh, and if you're not a meteorite aficionado, let me just tell you there are very few of these. Here are two samples and they're very poorly understood. They don't fit the simple story of either the planetesimal didn't melt and it has metal and silicate closely mixed, or it did melt and it's got a metal core and a silicate rocky exterior. These are mixtures in both of these that you see here, Gushba and Ishigevo. The, the gray part is, is metal, that's iron nickel metal from you know meteoritical metal and the and the brown part is is silicate rock but the silicate rock has a very specific characteristic that you geologists will appreciate it has almost no iron oxide in it it is it, the rock itself is almost iron free and the metal is filled with iron that puts you in a very small and special class of processes that could possibly make a rock like this. And it's thought that especially Gujba on the left is more or less the frothy remnants of a giant impact into one of these early planetesimals or embryos. It looks like the metal was liquid once, doesn't it? It looks like they froze in spheres, liquid spheres, um, and then uh, accreted back together. And so that is absolutely possibly how Gujba was formed. But a question I might ask is, is it plausible that all of Psyche, something that's almost the size of Switzerland, could just be the froth from a piece of impact? Could it be like the foam of impact frozen and, and, and held in the asteroid belt? It fits all the data, but from a process point of view, it seems highly unlikely. So this is a really important message for you. Every 
hypothesis we have for what psyche might be that fits the data is highly unlikely. There's, there's no scenario for psyche that fits beautifully into what we think of as the standard way that planetesimals and then asteroids are formed. And so this is why I repeat that it's likely to be a surprise, but I'm telling you our best thinking. And what I always ask is any of you with brilliant ideas about what we might be missing or other aspects to consider, please let me know. Always interested, always trying to create more uh, knowledge there. All right, so how does a NASA mission happen? I've now explained to you um, a bit about the theory of where we think asteroids come from, from these planetesimals. The asteroids are now, um, uh, they're, they're basically isolated out between Mars and Jupiter, um, um, held there by, by really by, by the protection that Jupiter's giant gravity field creates such that no large planet was formed nearby and the asteroids can survive there. And they're all more or less just the remnants, the shrapnel of planetary formation. So how does this happen? The first thing that happened was back in 2011, so a decade ago uh, right now, um, I and my friends Benjamin Weiss and Maria Zuber wrote this paper uh, with the completely compelling and absolutely comprehensible title of chondrites as samples of differentiated planetesimals. So if you're in the field, you understand what this means. And otherwise, obviously, this is an extremely niche peer-reviewed scientific paper, like every peer-reviewed scientific paper. And it created quite a stir at the time, which is always incredibly fun. Uh, you know, the, the, the 12 people in the world who were very closely connected to this were, were incensed, fascinated, enraged, otherwise upset. And at the Lunar and Planetary Science Conference where Ben gave his companion paper and then I stood up to give this paper, the room was absolutely full. There were a couple hundred people there, I'm not sure how many, standing room only. <laughs> and people lined up at the microphones um, to give me what for before before I even started speaking. And so that's kind of the best outcome possible in science where you've got people's attention and you're going to have a conversation and new knowledge will come out of it. And so um, in the end, we did present this interesting idea and it continues to kind of morph through the scientific literature in interesting ways. Um, but what happened as a direct result was something completely unforeseen to me in my career, which was I got an email from a couple of scientists at Jet Propulsion Laboratory and I'll just add that I'm at Jet Propulsion Laboratory today. I'm not at the university. I'm sitting in a borrowed office at JPL. And they wrote to me and said, we'd like to propose a mission based on your paper. We wanna test your hypothesis with a space mission. And I thought, wow, what could be more fun than having this conversation? So we started the conversation. And that's all it was in the beginning, just four or five of us having a conversation. Is there an object we could visit with a robotic probe to learn more about the truth of our idea. And that is how the mission started. So we started down a pathway that I would love to go on and on about because uh, the proposal process was so mind blowing. And I just have a couple minutes to talk about it. This is the cover of our first proposal. What happens with these big competed missions with NASA was we spent three years preparing our, our ideas. And that's a short amount of time. We did this about as fast as it could ever be done. And at the end of three years, it, the, the call came from NASA. We'd been anticipating this call to compete for this mission class. It's every three or four years that this happens. And we wrote our step one proposal. It took about 40 people. There's no money to do this. It's all volunteer, like we do write all of our grant proposals. The proposal was about 250 pages long, and this was the cover. This was done by a professional artist in Hollywood. And you can see right now what this is. This is the picture of two planetesimals hitting each other to knock off some of the rock and reveal the metal within. So this is our simplest idea about what Psyche might be. And we're trying to tell the story even with the cover art. So there were 28 proposals competing. And we, uh, I received a phone call sitting at home in my, in my dining room one day that we'd been selected to move to step two, which was amazing, amazing to be selected. There were all these reasons we were not gonna be selected. Uh, uh, primary among which was that this was our first time through the proposal process. And usually this incredibly onerous and difficult proposal process takes more than one time before you're either, if you're lucky selected or just give up. So there we were competing now with five, four other missions and ourselves. And we got to write our step two proposal this is the cover of step two. 
This is about 30 seconds after step one, even though in real time it was over a year later. <laughs> <laughs> um, with the impactor streaking off to the bottom left and the, and the red metal interior of the planetesimal being revealed from underneath the rock. This second proposal was over a thousand pages long. It's called the Concept Study Report, and it gives every detail of everything about the mission. Soup to nuts, budget, schedule, personnel, science, orbits, trajectories, launches, everything. And uh, it took about 140 people to put together. And then uh, January, I think, 3rd or 4th of 2017, I got the call from Thomas Zerbuchen, the associate administrator at NASA, that we'd been selected for flight. And that was the moment that changed the rest of my life, absolutely. So our first objective with the mission is to determine whether their psyche is a core or if it's unmelted material, because it's possible that if you had very reducing environment, an environment that would strip the iron of its oxygens, steal it out of the rocky part and put it into the metal part, you could create a body that was largely iron metal and that had a rocky material that had very little iron in it. And that's a way to do it without melting. So is Psyche the core of a planetesimal or a part of a core or is it unmelted material or something else? That's our number one thing that we're trying to find out with this mission. And uh, we're well along. I'm gonna show you flight hardware in a moment, which is always the most exciting thing um, and amazing that after a year, after 10 years of working on this, we are now getting pretty close to launch. So again, that picture at the top middle is an artist's interpretation. I spent um, perhaps a year on, on Zoom meetings on the weekends with this um, Hollywood illustrator, Peter Rubin, explaining to him the science while he tried to make it into a picture. So you see in this idea of Psyche that it has these rusty yellow parts that we think of as iron sulfide liquids that were expelled or maybe erupted onto the surface of Psyche in the core forming process. And maybe the rest of Psyche is a mixture of rock from near the core and metal from the core of a planetesimal one guess among many, surely it's not gonna look like that, who even knows? It's a partnership among Arizona State University where I am as the lead of the mission, the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, California, where I am right now, which uh, is in charge of managing the mission. So um, in charge of uh, putting the hardware together, managing the builds of the hardware and operating the mission once it's in space. So I'm here um, more or less half of my time working with the team. Right now our team, in total is about 500 people, um, some of them full-time, not all of them full-time. At peak, we're about 800, but now the hardware has almost all been delivered to Jet Propulsion Laboratory and we are assembling it. And that's what you'll see pictures of. Maxar is our industry partner. This is the standard way that NASA runs missions. We choose an industry partner and that was a very interesting process um, to build what's called the spacecraft chassis the big central box of the spacecraft and the power system, the solar panels. And then that gets shipped to Jet Propulsion Laboratory and everything else gets integrated. So those, that's the leads, um, ASU, JPL, and Maxar. And then we're getting instruments from the Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Laboratory, Mail and Spice, Space Science Systems, and Danish Technical University. I'll show them on the next slide, the science instruments, the payload as we call it. And of course, there are literally dozens of other companies and universities and research groups that are part of this mission spread across the US and in Europe. These are the instruments that we're flying. We're flying multispectral imagers on the left. That's led by Arizona State University manufactured by Mail and Space Science Systems. And those are our cameras. Before I go any further, I want to point out in case you hadn't been struck by this yet, that so far I've given you no acronyms for the names of anything. The mission itself title is not an acronym. These instruments are not acronyms. I just think there are way too many acronyms and I wanted it to be as straightforward and comprehensible as possible. So our imagers are called imagers. Our magnetometers are called magnetometers. And so that those magnetometers in the middle, there are two of them on the flight and they are uh, manufactured by Danish Technical University. And I, I couldn't say enough good things about that group. They've been spectacular to work with and the magnetometers are all delivered and installed. You'll see them in the pictures I'll show. 
And then on the right, the gamma ray and neutron spectrometer, which is the proper name of this instrument. And I didn't know much of anything about these before, you know, a decade ago when I started working on this. So I'm suspecting that many of you on the, on here with us today also do not know what this is. And I just want to explain it to you because I love the whole concept so much. Um, on, on the right hand side, there are the neutron spectrometers and they're measuring neutrons, you know, the subatomic particles that are coming off of the surface of Psyche um, and uh, at different energies. And so they measure those with those tubes. And then the, the left-hand part is the, is the gamma ray spectrometer. Inside the gamma ray spectrometer in that green box is, is a crystal of, of the element germanium, a crystal the size of my fists, you know, sort of, um, I don't know, I would call it a baseball sized um, crystal, which apparently I've been told is the purest material made by humans. It's 100% germanium as close as is possible. Now, why are we flying this crystal? What does it do? So here's the bigger picture. Flying through our solar system at all times, bombarding our earth, often stopped, but not always by the atmosphere, are high energy particles called um, intergalactic cosmic rays. Maybe you've heard the phrase cosmic rays, if you're not right in the field. These are um, very high energy little particles that are formed, it seems, in the center of galaxies, not solar systems, but in the center of galaxies, maybe by interactions with the black holes that are at the center of galaxies. And they fly through the universe and they saturate our solar system just like every other part of the universe. Now, what good are these things? It turns out they strike mercilessly the surfaces of airless bodies like Psyche. So Psyche and the moon and any other body without a protecting atmosphere is struck all the time by cosmic rays. And the energy of the cosmic ray strikes an atom in the surface of Psyche and that atom absorbs the energy and becomes excited. And then when it releases the energy, it gives off a gamma ray and a neutron hence the gamma ray and neutron spectrometer. And it turns out that the gamma ray it gives off is at an energy that is specific to the atom that was struck. So by measuring the energies of the gamma rays that hit our germanium crystal, we are actually measuring the exact atomic composition of the surface of Psyche. This is a way how that from orbit, because we're not landing, just orbiting, by orbiting Psyche, we can actually measure its surface composition thanks to intergalactic cosmic rays. I think that's a pretty great story. So that's our third instrument. Here's the chassis, that central part of the spacecraft with a, a human for scale, it's quite large. Um, you can see on the left, this, this boom structure that's partly in hot pink and it's holding the gamma ray spectrometer and the neutron spectrometers. And then you can see on the right, also the magnetometers away from the spacecraft body, because we want those instruments to be measuring the asteroid and not the spacecraft. You can see the magnetometers. There's one at the top of the boom and one part way down the boom. That's called a gradiometer configuration. It allows us to subtract the magnetic field created by the spacecraft and thus measure only what we hope will be a magnetic field on Psyche. On the left, you can see also the big dish, which is our high gain antenna that we'll use to communicate with Earth. And also on the left, lower down is something that is an acronym, DSOC. This is the Deep Space Optical Communications um, uh, Instrument. It's a technological uh, demonstration that we're flying for NASA. It's totally separable from our science mission and we will not be using it for science. But while the spacecraft is transiting out past Mars, it will practice communicating with the Earth using lasers instead of radio. Turns out you can encode a lot more information in a laser, and we hope that this will be the way that we'll get virtually broadband communications with Mars in the future. So this is a technological demonstration, which I think is really very fun, and I have high hopes for it. Then you can see on the right, you can see the cameras peeking out of the back of the spacecraft and at the bottom, something called an SPT ion thruster. This is our propulsion system. This spacecraft is, is moved by solar electric propulsion. Here's what the spacecraft looks with its solar panels unfolded. It'll be um, almost 25 meters across about the size of a singles tennis court. And at the earth, this is a 20 kilowatt solar panel set. The electricity from the solar panels will run all of the instruments, the heaters, the coolers, everything we need for the spacecraft. And it will also ionize 
uh, a great big tank bit by bit of the, of the noble gas xenon that then get accelerated out of those little thrusters. And that's how the spacecraft is moved. It's moved through the Hall effect of accelerating uh, ionized noble gases through a potential field and out the back of the, solar, uh, of, the, of the spacecraft and giving the spacecraft a little impulse from the loss of those atoms. So we're actually flying um, uh, about a thousand kilograms of xenon. That is our propellant. We are launching on a SpaceX Falcon Heavy with two side boosters that'll be in the configuration shown here. And those two side boosters will be returned to Earth and landed with any luck. And then they will be given to the NASA Europa Clipper mission for them to use on their launch a couple of years later. I'm very excited about this launch. What will happen is uh, the trajectory that you see here. Um, around four o'clock on this picture, you can see launch August 20 of 22. Our launch period opens August 1st. So we are less than nine months away from launch. It is a crazy, crazy time of building and finding errors and fixing them and swapping out hardware and trying to make it all work. We're very, very busy right now. So during that, um, the time the trajectory is covered with red, that's a 90 day checkout. And then every place there's a blue dot, that's the deep space optical communications test, that tech demo with the laser comms. Every place there's a gray band over the trajectory, we're going to be thrusting using those xenon thrusters. So we launch in August. In May of the following year, we get a gravity assist by flying by Mars, which slingshots us out. You can see us spiraling out until January of 2026 when we meet with Psyche and we enter into orbit around Psyche. We will orbit Psyche for 21 months. During that time, Psyche will continue to orbit around the sun, of course, carrying us all the way around the sun to the end of orbit ops in October of 2027. So that's our plan. Uh, I can't say enough about the team. This has become really the obsession of my life. How you get groups of people to create something so complicated that no one person understands how it works. And these are just a few people. As I said, we're at 500 people now. So this is just a little part of our team. And from the beginning, we've very consciously set norms of behavior something which I think is critical. I just wrote a big essay about this this summer about, about uh, how to create interdisciplinary, respectful teams of people in academia doing research. It's so interesting because everything hinges on the people. And in academia, we're often brought up to be the singular hero of the hero model, where it is I who have all the ideas and I who have the charisma and the fame, and it's my fame that's gonna carry me in my field. And, Frankly, that's a sort of ugly way to do work. I'm so interested in this team model. So huge shout out to the Psyche team, fantastic group of people to work with, creating miracles during COVID. So where are we now? We are trying to create miracles during COVID. This is a paper that's just in review, Psyche project implementation during the COVID pandemic, because you literally cannot build hardware remotely. You have to be there in person. And we've been making it work and we're gonna hit our launch. So here we are in the grayed out part of the timeline on the left starting in 2017 when we were selected as opposed to 2011 when we started working on this. So since 2017, we're now, we're now just finishing out our fifth year. Um, we are less than nine months to launch as you see. Launch is there in August of 2022 the Mars flyby in 2023, arrival at Psyche in 2026, and then all of our science ops. And it gives you a sense of um, the very long timeline for, for, for missions. All of those other acronyms, I know I said I wasn't gonna have any, but these are all the natural acronyms of NASA reviews. So going through review after review with our paid professional review panel, helping us get it right, helping us sort out challenges we hadn't noticed, find solutions to things that we're struggling with. It really takes an army of people. So let me show you some pictures. This is shipping the spacecraft down from Maxar in Northern California to Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Southern California. This is a spacecraft shipping container, this great big white box. And on the side of it, it says, it says instruments for space flight do not drop. <laughs> so you can imagine even with, you know, 
alarmed escorts driving in the middle of the night, you know, stopping intersections, things like that. I was very nervous about that transit. Arrived at, at Jet Propulsion Laboratory safely in March of this year. What you're seeing here is um, the gray box with the booms on the left for the instruments being lifted by a hoist and brought over to that ring on the right, which locks into the bottom of the spacecraft and holds it up so we can keep building it. That's called a dolly, that great big thing with the vertical arm and the ring lock. And that lock is the same as the lock that holds it onto the rocket in the end. So March of 2021, it arrived. And here it is in, um, in what's called the high bay. This is a class 100,000 or better um, clean room. The, the size of what you're seeing here, where the spacecraft is today, in fact, being, um, being built. And there's the spacecraft on its dolly, and that's a panorama I took of the, of, the, of the room. Now, all of these pictures are cleared for release, but in general, pictures are not cleared for release until JPL um, checks them out. So these are all okay. Uh, here's a big panel with the avionics and the telecommunication systems going, being installed in April, carefully lifted up, brought over to the side of the spacecraft and attached. Here is the flight electronics that would connect to the imagers, to the cameras. I want to show this to you because you see on the side the names of the people who worked, the companies that worked on it, um, and the symbols of the mission and, and of the imager. This is pretty standard to laser cut in testimony of all the people who worked on a piece of hardware onto the side of the hardware. And it's very emotional for all of us to see our names on this thing that's going to space. Here is the fantastic Danish Technical University team delivering their two beautiful magnetometers and the box of magnetometer uh, electronics being delivered to Jet Propulsion Laboratory. And here they are installed on the boom, like I showed in that picture, one at the end and one part way back. The harnessing at this moment isn't done. It's still wrapped up in that, in that non-conductive foil right there. Here is um, the team of the Deep Space Optical Communications um, tech demo. And that is the, um, the thing that's in silver wrapped foil dangling from the bottom of the spacecraft on the left and just above the team on the right. What a miracle it was to get this amazing thing built really inventing it and building it at the same time. It's all installed on the spacecraft now. That was a very proud moment. Here we are one year from launch with our kind of hero picture of the, of the, um, of the spacecraft. Those two red tanks that you see there are nitrogen gas for just small propulsion, not to move the spacecraft to Psyche, but just to make orbital adjustments and things like that. The great big xenon tanks are further inside. Um, here's the gamma ray and the neutron spectrometers delivered August 2021. They were delivered by FedEx, which does ship flight hardware. When you ship flight hardware, it has to be fully instrumented. You need to know exactly the temperature and the pressure and the stresses, and it has to be air conditioned completely with redundant backup systems. And then you can track it just like any FedEx package, and you can see it moving across the country, and you get a little email in your inbox that says your package has been delivered, which really I thought was hilarious, actually. So we're very happy it was delivered safely and is now installed on the spacecraft. So there's the gamma ray spectrometer at the end of the boom and the neutron spectrometers wrapped in foil partway down in the electronics. That just happened in August. Now, here is a, a chart that we looked at in our weekly and sometimes daily um, updates for a couple of years with the um, payload element, the imager, the deep space optical com, the mag magnetometers and so forth on the left column and the delivery date. And then we put in there the delivery date of the babies of some of our team members. Um, we love the fact that this team is extremely diverse gender, racial, social, economic background, you name it, very diverse team. And we were so happy to um, celebrate the delivery of babies onto our team in addition to the, the hardware. And these, um, these two moms, one has just come back to work and the other is still home with her baby. Here are the SPT-140 Hall thrusters being installed in August. They are the red capped units there on an articulating arm so that you can orient them away from the spacecraft to get the angle of thrust just right. Now, a fascinating thing about these is that they have to go through a test to show that their arm will move away and articulate um, and move the thrusters just like they're supposed to, but they're not designed to work under earth gravity. So here you see this, um, this L-shaped aluminum thing with the hanger 
and a, and, a, and a cable going down and holding on to the end of the arm. You can see the hanger and the cable and the two guys staring up at it on the right. That is to offload earth gravity so that the arm can practice without the, the strain of gravity. So it just gives a sense of the many levels of complication. Here is the NASA image of the day for October of our Hall thruster in testing in a vacuum chamber on the left before installation on the right after installation. We are preparing right now for system environmental testing. That's what we'll be doing for the next number of months before we get ready to, to ship to, to Cape Kennedy, to Cape Canaveral in, in Florida. Um, the spacecraft is on the left and you can see that now there's blanketing over the booms. And on the right is a great big tent which effectively acts as a Faraday cage so we can do electromagnetic testing of the spacecraft. And we have to be so careful with the spacecraft. You actually put on a, a wrist strap and you ground yourself into a, into a special socket in the wall before you're allowed into the clean room so that you're not carrying static in your clothing. So we're very careful. Here I am with Melody Asapavizade, who's the head of our test beds. That is, we have exact um, duplicates of all of the hardware and harnessing and electronics in this room. And we practice with the flight software to make sure we know how the spacecraft works perfectly. And we keep it running after flight in case we need to test for things. So she's in charge of our test beds. It was great to visit. And here I am um, with the spacecraft. I'm on the right with the glasses, obviously. And on the left is Henry Stone, the project manager at Jet Propulsion Laboratory, someone I'm so pleased and privileged to work with. And finally, here I am on the left under the spacecraft with Brian Bone with the flashlight. He's, he's the head of assembly test and launch operations, everything that's happening in the clean high bays. And he's showing me the installation of the telecom equipment with, by pointing at it with his flashlight. And so I just want to leave you um, with the invitation to our, our, our website, where we have tremendous numbers of um, ways that you can get involved, actually, and all the information about the mission and a lot of art created by students. And then uh, we're active on Twitter. And the mission is active also on Instagram and Facebook. And, uh, and just some thoughts to be bold and be kind. And I'm so grateful for your time today. Thank you so much for letting me join you. Thank you very much, Lindy, for the fascinating talk about the, the, the mission, what's gone into it, and, and what's kind of what you're hoping to find as well. Um, I find it really illuminating both the science, but also, um, and the brief, but your comments about the importance of kind of being able to create teams that work at that scale. And I think that's probably true at all scales, actually, as well. So, yeah, thank you very much. So agree. So we've had some questions coming in through the kind of questions and answers. And I guess uh, to everyone who's here, given the large numbers, rather than kind of uh, an unmute and a raise hand sort of um, chaos, I guess if I can ask people to put questions into the, into the Q&A part of the chat, I think that's how we'll try and deal with picking up some of these questions. Um, Mark's been behind the scenes answering a few of them, and a few of them have been answered also as you've been going. So I'll kind of pick up and pass these on. I'll try and um, I'll try and pick up a range. We may not have time to, to ask everything. So yeah, I'll I'll kind of um, I will pick up a range of those questions. So I, I think the first one, and, and, and apologies to anyone who put them in, because this does mean that it has my bias in terms of which ones I might pick at times. Um, so I think one of the first ones that sort of unanswered that remains was when you showed the the kind of initial observations and guesses around the, the density for Psyche and how those changed over time. So one of the questions, what, what was there a particular source of any of that discrepancy um, as to why people were previously estimating it to be kind of much higher density and therefore potentially much more metallic? Yeah, it's so, so interesting. And um, that's not my subfield, so I don't know all the details. And indeed, it makes me think I've got to look back at that one really high density paper and figure out what they did. There really isn't even a candidate material that has that density. So it's interesting to think about what they did. So, but it's a, it's a two part process. First, you have to observe Psyche's orbit being deflected very small amounts by distant objects. There, there are no objects near Psyche. The asteroid belt is not at all like Star Wars, right? It's incredibly empty. Um, and, so, and so there have to be very, uh, meticulous observations of, of tiny deflections of Psyche by very distant large objects. And that's how you get its mass. So to get to density, then you need its volume. 
And the volume is generally done by studies like the one I showed you from the European Southern Observatory, where they make a shape model by looking at how Psyche's shape changes as it, as it spins. Sometimes they combine a reflected light with a radar model, and then they build a shape model and estimate its, its volume. And, and of course, they only have a certain fidelity, which we, don't, we won't know what that is till we get there, but the three best shape models differ by about 10% at one sigma right now and about 30% at three sigma. So if you combine, say, a 30% error in volume with who knows how much error in mass, then you get a range of possible densities that would come out. Uh, so, so by combining many people's quite different efforts, that's how we come to about 4,000. And I'd be surprised it was very different than that when we get there, but that's the process. Thanks for that. Um, I'm going to follow on with a, a, a follow sort of a question that's somewhat related around Psyche, and then I'll move to a couple of the questions that have come in around the, the sort of leadership and team teamwork. So, and given we've just picked up the question about the shape, are there any hypotheses for for what causes the irregular shape um, in in terms of that? It, it must be impacts. It must be that it's been battered. Um, although there are two possible answers, really. I think one is that maybe once it was rounder or bigger and it's been battered by impacts when the solar system was quite crowded and full of impacts very early. And the other is that um, only uh, liquids or large bodies that under pressure in their own gravity act as liquids. So maybe Psyche was always small and solid and it never became round, that could be. Okay, thanks for that, Lindy. So, um, so these are so just sorry to, um, and I think it's appropriate. So, these are some of the questions from um, from Jeff Greenspan, and there are some more from 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 Jeff as well. But I'll just pick up some of the kind of other from some of the other perspectives. So, there's a question from Anushka Sharma, which is, what's been the biggest learning over the past decade, and particularly on the leadership perspective? Hmm. Um. Maybe I'll say, maybe I'll respond with what maybe my top lesson learned just personally. Um, there is in general, I think a human, a human wish to not reveal too much because you feel unsafe. If you talk about all the ways that you're struggling or the problems that you're having, you want to seem like you're successful. I think this is human nature. And it's certainly true with funded projects reporting back to their funding agency. You want to look good. You want them to like you. You want to seem to be successful. You don't want to, you know, be made to sit in the corner on a high chair, you know. Um, but I, I don't know why, but I, I came into this with a, a very strong conviction that that was not the way to do it. That in fact, all of us were on the same side trying to make a really difficult thing happen. And the best thing I could possibly do was talk about everything as transparently as I possibly could so that I was effectively enlisting our reviewers and the people at NASA headquarters and everyone who wasn't directly on the team to be part of the team, inviting them to be part of the team, showing them our secrets and our warts and our challenges um, so that we would all be most efficiently pulling together. And, and, and it's not the way that all missions are run. And someone on our team said, you know, you're exhibiting radical transparency <laughs> because I insisted from the beginning that when we gave a review, we talk about all the things we've done that were going okay and say, you know, happy to talk about these in any depth, but here are the places where we're actually facing some challenges. Here's what we've tried to do so far on each one. This is kind of where we're stuck. Love to get your opinions on what to do next. So to show that we weren't incompetent, we knew where our problems were and we had thought hard about how to fix them. And now we could use some team effort. And it turns out that approach has been tremendously fruitful. Um, the people at headquarters know that we're not obfuscating or making a shiny marketing piece. They know exactly where we are. So there's a certain trust and relaxation about the communications and we've gotten so much help uh, and uh, in, in the best possible way. So to me, that was the big learning, that if you can be fearless enough to um, describe seriously all the problems and really identify your problems for others and point them out, it's actually really helpful for building a team. Thanks, Lindy. Um, and as a sort of follow on from that, then a question from Jan Zinko is that, 
so how and I guess this could be a, a long question, but I guess to summarize, how, how does the communication work for such a large team from so many different disciplines? Oh, it's a constant challenge. And again, like any brilliant ideas that any of you have, I would I would love to hear. Um, so one answer is lots of meetings, and um, we really have so many meetings. Some of my days are 10 and 12 hours of meetings without breaks. It's um, and uh, almost none of them are useless. You know, I have a meeting of the top leadership team and then I need to listen to what's happening on an engineering team and they need to communicate. And so and really just a lot of talking to each other in structured purposeful ways. And then we have um, a significant events email that comes out every week explaining what's happening. We have every week a meeting with headquarters and a meeting with the other NASA centers. And then every week we also have a meeting with the, with the top management of Jet Propulsion Laboratory, always updating, here are our top risks. These are the top challenges. Here's the thing we need help with so that every single week and no one's ever surprised. We try to follow sort of a, what they call a 24 hour rule. When something exciting or potentially terrible happens, don't get everybody spun up right away. Like find out the facts, do a little due diligence, give people a little heads up so they're not surprised. But then after 24 hours, give a really good report. And that way it stops people from panicking or overreacting. So those are some things. And then we have every two or three weeks, we have what we call an all team morning meeting where for about 45 minutes in the morning, um, I and Henry Stone report out on everything that's happened in the last couple of weeks to everyone on the team who wants to come all at once in a massive WebEx. So those are some of the things. Okay, so, I'm going to follow up on that. Do you, uh, what sort of proportion of people do you get coming to that kind of all that open all all sort of staff or, or all team member meeting? So it's interesting to we know usually, how. We usually get between um, uh, between 100 and 200. We usually get and uh, which tend to be the people who are more full-time or more than half-time, like people who are really, really involved or especially involved in currently what's happening on the mission. And it seems to be really quite effective. Thanks. So, so coming back to, if it's all right to come back to a couple more of the science questions. Um, this question about the, the uh, a question around the choice of spect spectrometers and was there, are they, are they chosen based on particular elements or what's the reasoning for those particular particular choices? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, and um, for those of you who follow robotic space exploration, very often there's um, there's a visible and near infrared spectrometer of that particular instrument, visible and near infrared spectrometer that's flown, which actually takes the reflection spectra from the body. Now I was talking about reflection spectra we get from earth. You might've noted that we don't have an instrument on the orbiter that takes reflection spectra. And the reason we don't is because those are generally most effective for silicate rocky min minerals. They actually identify fundamentally the structure of the mineral. For metals, they just have a flat reflection spectra. You really don't get much back. Um, and so uh, after we couldn't afford to fly both. So we had a hard decision and decided on the gamma ray neutron spectrometer because it does individual atoms instead of crystal structures. So that's why we chose it. Okay, thanks. Um, and then um, I guess, sorry, I'm just picking through picking through the questions here. Um, so maybe one one something with, with a slightly different focus is: Has there been much discussion about what the data from this mission might be able to tell us about the Earth's core, and is that something that's also a kind of a, a longer term target of of the mission? Yes. Uh... If Psyche ends up to be a part of a metal core, it could be the only metal core that humans ever see. Other than the little fragments of iron meteorites, we're never going to see the cores of any of our rocky planets, the pressure, the temperature, the engineering, it's just not going to happen. And so one thing we hope to be able to compare is, um, for the aficionado, the, the, um, the uh, uh, oxidation state under which this planetesimal core was made and compared to how we think the earth was made because fundamentally thousands of psyches would have gone into making the earth's core and there would have been multiple generations of impacts and core forming events to make the earth's core which is this big hybrid core psyche could be the part of perhaps one of the very first cores the first generation of cores so we'll look at oxidation state we'll look at what light elements it carries with it um, in the core material 
And we hope that way to learn about the ingredients of the Earth's core. Thanks. Um, probably two quick ones left. So there's one that that been kind of partly answered, but uh, so there was a there was a question from Pamela, which was asking um, whether the perhaps that initially sorry, this is showing my ignorance that uh, the two Mars probes that had been dropped from the mission. Uh we uh, actually never had Mars probes on this mission. I think you're thinking of a different mission. Um, we were at one point going to have a CubeSat that we were going to um, fly at Psyche and that was dropped. Okay, and I think, I mean, Mark, Mark, Mark replied to this that I guess in general, and, and as you sort of indicated, the challenges of these sorts of missions must be kind of, well, huge around the different things that you can do from both kind of time and cost and all of those things. And risk, exactly, yep. Okay. Um, so I think I'm just gonna see if I can pick up if there's um, anything else more general or if I'm just checking if anything else has come in. Okay, so, um, ah, yeah, so question from uh, Aftab Khan. So what can you tell about the magnetometer and its objective? Um, I, I know you've noted that the, with the two that there's the gradients. So, it, the, yeah, I guess if you can expand on any of the kind of targets with the from the from that side. Sure. Well, there's actually never been um, a magnetic field of an asteroid measured in flight, and um, we hope here's a kind of a hope that Psyche is a part of a core, and that that core did form a magnetic dynamo like the Earth's core has and creates our magnetic dynamo and that parts of Psyche might have recorded that magnetic field. So our dearest hope is that we arrive there and it has a strong remnant magnetic field, um, just like a handheld magnet. It's no longer active, of course, but then it has that field locked into it. And that by measuring a strong magnetic field at Psyche, we would know that it once had a core dynamo and was therefore part of a core. So that's our, that's our best hope with the magnetometers. Thanks. And then um, coming back to maybe in a certain a nice point, sort of finish. So in terms of you know the, the early questions around the density of Psyche, that one of the questions is that whether the orbit of the satellite will help inform that, or in terms of giving further information about the density of Psyche, or will that be more from the kind of other measurements that are made, or a combination of both? Yeah, we'll be doing a gravity experiment by by watching how the Psyche spacecraft is accelerated or decelerated by mass anomalies in the asteroid itself as it orbits. So if the Psyche spacecraft is coming around the Psyche asteroid and there's a very dense area ahead of it, it'll be tugged forward a bit by the density of that. Or if there's a big dense behind it, it'll be slowed down slightly. And so we'll see its tiny slows and speeds according to the density of the asteroid by looking at the Doppler effect of radio transmissions all the way back to the Earth. And so using the Doppler effect, we will actually make gravity maps of Psyche. And with those gravity maps, we'll be able to integrate and know um, uh, its bulk density and also the density of different parts of it. Okay, thanks. And so I'm gonna take an opportunity to have, in essence, my, my, my turn for a question, if, if that's all right. <laughs> um, and so, Obviously, so the you know with the launch date coming, as you say, very kind of quite quickly, and then that relatively long period of time. Although given the the duration of since the proposal went in, what sort of activity continues through that period between launch and getting out to Psyche? Kind of is yeah. that a time where you're going to be continuing to be heavily involved with the Psyche mission, or is that a moment where you might be able to kind of have a, have a breathe for a minute and relax and think about other things as well. Yeah. I had a fantasy about case B in your description there, and I'm told by the team that that is not the case. I'm told that if anything, we just get busier because first we have the checkout of everything, and then we have the calibration of the instruments and a whole bunch of tests, and then we're going to be um, working in tremendous detail on the exact science operations that are gonna happen. We have it all sketched out to a pretty high degree, but a lot of that work will happen during cruise, figuring out all the contingency cases and exactly when different pieces of data are gonna be downloaded and what's gonna happen at each orbit and all our decision points. So um, apparently the cruise is gonna be really busy for us. So, so I think that's probably a nice point to say, well, 
really good luck. Um, and, you know, I hope thank that, that all, go, all goes really well. I, I'd like to thank you hugely for, you know, a fascinating talk. Um, I might be in touch separately about some of the some of your your kind of thoughts on on the on the team building and the leadership as well because I find it I kind of find it really interesting be interesting I'd love to hear to more talk but talk with you about that yeah, yeah. but no th thank you again for I mean obviously you know you're hugely busy at the moment so to take this time at this point of of where you are within that mission status as well is is really appreciated so I guess uh, it's always a bit difficult online but if we could put our hands together and thank um, <laughs> Professor Lindy Elkinstanson for a, a fascinating talk. <laughs> Thank you so much. It was great fun and I really appreciate the interest. And um, I have just one request, which is that you all literally keep your hands, your fingers and toes crossed for us because there's a lot of work to be done and we really can't miss our launch period. So um, I know it hurts, but keep your toes crossed for us. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. And thank you everyone for coming to attend to the on. It's been really nice to see large numbers of people and the questions. Um, I think the breadth of what you're covering is is really interesting. So, yeah, thanks to everyone for attending. Um, apologies that I'm looking at the screen, thinking it'd be nice to sort of see and know everyone, but I don't see don't see that. But yeah, just thanks for everybody's time. Thanks so much, everyone. Yeah, Take thank care, you again, everybody. Lindy, for taking your time. I drop you an email soon. So, so great much. to see you and great to meet you, Stuart. And thanks.